Welcome to A New Direction. My name is Jay Izzo, and oh man, do we have a great show. I'm just telling you, it is fantastic. We are going to have so much fun, and you're going to learn so very much. And oh my gosh, if you are watching us live, okay, I mean, okay, great. You know, you watch us live on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter. Also, we're on DBNA TV if you're on uh, Roku and have an Amazon Fire device. Uh, you know, we have these shows. So if you get to watch it, you're going to have a great advantage. But if you're listening to us, whether it's on a podcast or you're listening to us live on Castbox FM, and thank everybody uh, from around the world who does that. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I have a guest today. His name is Martin Brooks. And there was this show on TV and it had about nine episodes, eight or nine episodes. And it was called Lie to Me. <laughs> and it was about the art of discovering deception, right? It was a clever story, right? Guess what? The guy who did the show and the guy I'm talking to had this thing in common. They have this, they have this expert knowledge of body detection and he's got this set of 50 cards called the body language decoder. Oh man, you're going to love this. I'm, I'm just telling folks, get your notes out. Just, just get your pads, get your papers. If you're driving, don't do that, but it, get them out because I'm going to tell you, this is going to be fun. We're going to talk about things in business you, and we're going to talk not just about lying, but we're going to talk about the positive aspects that that can help you right know more about your own body language and what are you telling everyone else including your feet what <laughs> what? what yeah we'll let's get, get to him <laughs> we get to him, mark brooks in just a second but before we do that let's do we do every week right hey listen we are four part people we are physical mental emotional spiritual people and here's the deal um in these four parts of who we are right we have to be in constant training of those areas of our life because if we're not the fact of the matter is, if we're not growing, we're dying. We have to be in constant training. So in the physical area, for instance, what we do on the show is on a scale of one to 10, I ask you every week about your physical training. Like, how is your exercise regimen? How are you eating right? Are you getting enough water? Are you getting enough sleep? Right? Are you doing these things that you need to take care of your body? And on a scale of one to 10, one being miserable, 10 being outstanding, how would you evaluate your training? Five being average. Right. So what is your number out there? So here's the deal. Whatever that number is, that's fine. Don't don't get alarmed if you say, well, I'm a two. Well, no, that's OK. That's a starting place for us to get you to a three. Right. Whatever that may is. Maybe it's putting down the bag of chips. Maybe it's maybe it's, you know, getting rid of the sodas. Maybe it's, you know, I can eat. I should really go out and walk, you know, just just walk a little bit. Good. OK. Whatever that is, you could start right now. Whatever that is, whatever your number is, it is. Start right now. To, to make some changes. All right, second number is the mental number, right? Hey, listen, you know, my background in psychology, you know, I love halves of the brain, right? I know we got a corpus callosum that connects both halves, but we have a left brain and a right brain. And the truth of the matter is about those two halves of the brain is that we have to exercise both halves. We have to have that logical mathematical side, which is on the left side. We need that creative kind of, uh, that creative side that's on the right side. Uh, a lot of times it's music and, 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 and language, but we need to kind of combine those two things. You know, it's a great way to get yourself from being a mental loafer sitting on a couch, hoping that things come at you. What's a great way to do it is to read like, like these 50 cards. If you read these cards, you're going to get both your mental and your uh, your left and right brain. It really is, right? You can learn an instrument. You can learn a new language. All those things help. But you know what? Get yourself doing something. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you say your mental growth is, your mental training? All right, third area is the emotional uh, area. And by the way, um, Martin, we're going to talk. Uh, you know, we're going to talk because you know what? Our body language affects our emotions. It really does. Maybe unconsciously, but it does affect them. So the question then becomes, right, what is our emotional training? Our emotional training is two areas. One is, how well are you able to control your emotions under stress and pressure? Right? And then the second piece is, how well are you able to understand and tap into the emotions of others? By the way, part of decoding other people's language, right, is being able to understand those things because you will see how you will see how their emotions are being reflected back to you. And not always is it accurate. So how do you know the difference? Martin's going to talk about that. And then finally, 
So whatever your number was going one to 10, that's your third number emotionally. Then finally, the spiritual area, we're all spiritual. Whether you want to believe it or not, we're all spiritual. We all have faith in something. We all believe that something's going to happen tomorrow that hasn't happened yet. That's faith. If you take away the mental and emotional and the physical, you know what? You're left probably with the spiritual. The truth of the matter is we all run to something when life gets hard. And we make that our uh, spiritual place of where we can come back to center and uh, we try to feel like we can get some spiritual centeredness right? And for some people, it's God. For some people, it's nature. For some people, it's meditation. For some people, it's something else. What is that for you? And is it working for you? And on a scale of one to 10, how is that working for you? And what might you need to do to change, right? Those four areas are like the legs of a chair, those four numbers that you have, right? Because you have now four numbers. And you know what? It's If the legs of a chair, if the legs are uneven, right? It creates bad posture. If the legs of the chair are too low, we can't sit at a normal table and eat. And what we want to do is bring those up at the same time. My new friend, Martin Brooks, has his legs all at the right height and he eats well at the table. And Martin Brooks is a body language expert. He is a top communications coach, author, and speaker. Martin specializes in how to use your body and how to use your body uh, more effectively when communicating. Martin is the author of the Body Language Decoder and creator of the online course, Body Language Communication Mastery, 100 Ways You Can Communicate with More Confidence, Credibility, and Charisma. He is obsessed with how <laughs> the world's top communicators use their body language to convince, influence, and motivate us, and with good reason. He has advised businesses, executives, entrepreneurs worldwide on how to use their body language to engage audiences more effectively. He has also has extensive experience working at top business schools like London Business School, Chicago Booth Business School, Pearson Business School, and Cass University. He, is, he's, uh, he has also been a course director at Chartered Institute of Marketing since 2008. Um, in 2018, Martin provided live analysis on the Discovery Channel of Mark Zuckerberg answering some tough questions to the United States Senate. Huh, how about that? And he's frequently called on by the media to analyze business leaders and politicians. He's been featured on BBC Radio, LBC Radio, and appeared on BBC Two during elections. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show and welcome for the first time ever on A New Direction, Martin Brooks. Martin, welcome to A New Direction. Well, thank you. It's fantastic to be here. I'm looking forward to this discussion. I am too. I am so stoked about it. All right. I don't want to get, I don't want to get too far ahead because, uh, the body language decoder is, uh, just a, just a, such a clever, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I can't call it a book because it's, it's these cards mm. and this little booklet, um, helping us understand, uh, about body language. And I know everybody's so interested in deception, right? They all want to know, is somebody lying to me? Somebody lying to me. We all want to know that, right? But we could we could kind of <laughs> but that's not the only reason that's not the only reason that we are we, we need to study body language is it no not at all because your body language i mean it, it, the clues in the name body language whenever mm. you're speaking there's a there's a, a supplementary language that's going on to that goes along with what you say it's how, how you look whilst you're saying it and of course there's the audio message of how you sound whilst you're saying it and body language, like you say, I mean, what you ask people about what they're really interested in, and deception will very often come up with the top one. And is that one side of it, as in, well, I want to be better at reading other people. But body language is that double-sided coin. It's like, yeah, you also realize you're available to be being read. And what are you giving out, be it deception or confidence or nervousness or any of the other the categories that's in body language decoder but that certainly is one that people are interested in and i think like you you mentioned lie to me earlier that's kind of raised the consciousness that people are going hang on is there actually any truth to this or is this just a nice entertainment show and as you said professor ekman who's the world's authority on deception detection was the scientific advisor behind the show and he really quality controlled what was in there so yes it was great entertainment but there was also his science in there. This is a beautiful science. I was, I was telling you briefly before we started the show that when I was teaching psychology classes at different colleges and universities, this would be, this would be an area that students just got all excited about, you know, because I think, I think we feel like there's some sort of power that we can have that I can see something that you can't see. Hmm. And is it that mystique that kind of attracts us to, you know, body, body that we want to learn more about it. Do you think that's part of it too? 
I think that's definitely part of it. And I think it comes from that life experience. You know, when you're talking to somebody and you just get that little feeling and you go, oh, there's something, there's, oh, there's something just not right. But I can't put my finger on what it is. So we can't act on it. We can't do anything about it because there isn't that scientific data. We don't want to say to our boss, to our spies, I've got a hunch. Let's make this big decision on this hunch. So we right. kind of hold back. And then, you know, three days, three weeks, three months later, we go, ah, oh, I knew this was going to happen. I knew this, this person was going to let me down. This family member was going to let me down. I knew that business deal was going to go bad. I, th I was convinced that salesperson was, uh, was lying through their teeth about that particular thing. Yeah. And that there's that gap between that, un what we would think is an unconscious hunch or a sixth sense versus you know the real the real truth what's actually happened because of course our little sixth sense can very often be wrong you know we think right. somebody is one way and it turns out they're the they're the other so for me that gap the fascination of closing that gap but also that the fact that somebody has that niggling feeling it probably is on some sort of unconscious level they are recognizing something there is a behavior that's stimulating their brain to go, yeah, there's there's something just not right, but I don't know what it is. And there's that disconnect between the unconscious and the conscious. And that's where I love that thing you said about constantly learning. Because if we're learning and going, now, why did I feel that? You know, anytime, basically, I, I see a public speaker, be it a business person or, you know, a, a, a politician, and I feel impressed, I've trained my brain to go, why? <laughs> what am I being impressed by? Just to have that insane curiosity about, you know, there must be something there. So it's that desire to understand why I'm feeling that way. Why am I feeling impressed? The, the, that, that, I've trained myself to go, I wrote this article a number of years ago, don't be in awe, be awesome. And the idea was that as soon as you felt yourself being impressed by somebody, and I live by this, as soon as I feel myself going, oh, wow. Now, I'd rather just sit back and make it a passive experience about being, oh, isn't this man or woman an incredible communicator? I taught myself, no, if they're awesome, I want to be awesome too. How are they doing it? Start paying attention to their mannerisms, to their body language, to their gestures, to their voice, the words they choose. And that curiosity, it's like, the, it's like, it's like a never ending challenge it's because there's always going to be something more to learn. And that, that really floats my boat. I love that aspect of it. And I think it comes back to the, that experience that we've all had of that niggling feeling. There's something going on. And that's why I loved the, when the publishers approached me about the cards, I thought it was the right combination between the visual aspect, you know, the pictures on one side and then the written word on the other really help people uh, bridge that knowledge gap and understand a little more. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm holding up a card here uh, and it's showing a picture of somebody kind of squinting down. It's called the sincerity squint. Mm. Um, uh, when a person uh, is, is, is seen when a person is talking about a topic close to their hearts and they narrow their eyes in a key moment. Yeah, they go, I really mean this. This is right. so important to me. And they just right. narrow their eyes that little bit. That just narrow it down. Fun. That's a fun. See, see, folks, I'm telling you, this is going to be fun stuff. You're going you're gonna to really love this. Okay. So here, here, I want to talk about some things that we need to caution ourselves because I think mm. we do need to be cautious. Yes. Here because um, I think sometimes we can go in with a mindset that we feel. <laughs> I, I hate to bring up another TV show, but it was one of my favorite TV shows. And it was called House. And I loved uh, House. Um, which was uh, that ran? That was a series that was very successful. And the character, uh, by the way, uh, Greg Greg Laurie was it? Um, Hugh Laurie. Hugh Laurie. Hugh Laurie. Uh, another British actor taking the lead role in an American right, series, actor, right? <laughs> and who had an amazing American accent would would say regularly on the show, "Everybody lies." Hmm. And so we can walk into this. Sometimes when we're looking at people and we're trying to decode, right, I think that if our mindset is, well, everybody lies, well, then we're just looking for lying and we don't give people the benefit of the doubt. There's a danger in that, isn't there? Absolutely. Uh, the thing, and there's a couple of things there that I think are really relevant. The, the, the first is that, that, you know, even deception experts to say one thing is not definitive 
evidence of deception. People can give out, sometimes when people are very nervous, a lot of the, the tells they can give out are, could, could be classed as deception, but actually they're just really nervous. They're not, they're not uh, being deceptive at all. So you, you got to put things in context. Also, you need clusters. What the deception experts will always talk about clusters. That's like two or three things all happening at the same time around a particular topic so that they all point in the same direction and always be more curious than looking to be judgmental. And the third thing, like you say, you know, we have part of our brain, you know, this you know, called the reticular activation system. It, it will, it's, it's basically like our own brain internal Google. If we go find me deception, it'll go, okay. And it'll go looking for it and then find the evidence with the, with the bias that we come at it. If this person is deceptive, then I will, I will find that information. But what like a Google search, like our brain will do, then it will, of course, ignore the stuff that doesn't fit the search term. So if we go looking for deception tells in a, in a scenario where a person might be nervous, we might find one and then our brain goes, ha, find the evidence to confirm my bias, I'm right. But yes, it's one piece of evidence. There were four or five others that suggested something else and you missed all the things that said confidence, for example, because you weren't looking for them. So I, I was, I've just started an uh, online course with a, uh, an author by the name of Pamela Meyer, and she's given the last time I checked the eleventh most popular TED talk of all time on deception. And she said, "You know, you, you just got to approach it. You got to take out judgment, and you've just got to be insanely curious. You just got to have that sense of curiosity, because you can rush so quickly into the wrong conclusion, and it's easy to do so." So. Uh, Decept people who do deception detection all the time, they caveat, look for clusters, be much more curious, uh, take your time to come to a conclusion because it's, it's easy to come to the wrong conclusion or, you know, tools can be dangerous. You know, <laughs> you get one tool, you go for it, you think, yeah, I'm right. But uh, the, particularly in the areas of deception, you need to hang back, be more curious and look for clusters. I, I, I think that's so important for people to understand but you also give us a couple other things you, you talk about context and culture mm. um and the circumstances uh those are the, the three c's that you kind of give us i know that's not the way you said them but i, <laughs> I, I like your version that's great <laughs> <laughs> the three c's uh so i mean right because so talk about con context culture and circumstances yeah so if you talk about context, for example, another really famous deception expert, a guy called Joe Navarro, I mean, he, he tells this great story about how he was interviewing this person. He was convinced that they were that they were being deceptive. And then when he voiced his concerns and he, and he actually said to the person and they, they voiced that they were worried that their car meter was about to run out. You know, that's that's what they were thinking. That's what was driving their emotion. And that was what was driving their behavior at that precise moment in time. And it was like, to him, it was like a real learning point about, well, context, you know, I'm seeing evidence, but what am I seeing evidence of? Am I putting this in the right context? So that's a, a huge one. Uh, culture can be different. Different cultures around the world express themselves that little bit differently. There's always those little uh, nuances. Um, but also you can get like, you know, the culture when you're communicating with your family versus the culture when you're communicating with your workmates. I mean, that can be a very different culture, what behaviors are acceptable or unacceptable or, or, or what, be, what become the norm within those particular uh, environments. So you got context, you got culture, and then you got you got you got context. You know, where, where, where is this happening, and what what's going on? How well do these people know each other? Let's let, let again coming back to that curiosity rather than than rushing towards any any conclusion. Remembering, as we said all the time, that yes, it's fascinating reading people, but we're also giving out messages. And what is our what is our body language saying to other people? Yeah, I, I, it's so it's so incredibly important that we keep this whole context thing in, in the context that the culture, the circumstances, because it's going to help us really understand. Also, I, as you say, you know, it's going to help us understand ourselves uh, mm -hmm. because uh, I think we all know that you know, given given the right context or the right circumstances, I may not be giving you the accuracy. My body may not be giving you the accurate. Mm. accurate signals yeah. uh you know depending on what's going on and, and you talk about that at, at length that there are certain circumstances that you find yourself in that you sometimes you could be what what did jerry seinfeld say 
he said, um, he said, you know, according to the research, um, you know, the number one reason uh, people are more afraid uh, that people are more afraid of speaking in public yes. than they are of dying. Yeah. So, so he said it would be better to be in the casket than to give the eulogy. Yeah. And um, uh, I'll let people think about that and laugh later. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but the truth of the matter is when and I'm a public speaker, you're a public speaker and you and I have done this for, you know, probably decades and uh, speaking in public. And I mean, I still do, do get butterflies probably like you do. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but we're, we, you know, you kind of get used to controlling it and you kind of know what you're doing, but I've seen a lot of people who, you know, I, I've seen them backstage who are not, you know, regular speakers and boy, they're just, they're, they're giving a whole set of body languages that you know is incongruent with what's going on inside the body, right? I mean, so even those circumstances can change how we how we react, right? I mean, I, I mean, I I don't know. Some people get starstruck, right, and they're in front of fame, and you start to see their body language alter, right, from what maybe normally would be, right? Is that, are those a pretty good example? Yeah, I mean, I mean, public speaking is something I've done for years. I actually, I've coached public speakers. I've coached uh, last, I think, six TEDx speakers. You know, helping them prepare to do TEDx uh, uh, talks. And one of the things that's fascinating to me is about uh, the 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 body language that people give out when they're nervous and how they manage that. And when I study psychology, one of the big things I took away from it right at the start was something called state management. What what state are you in and how do right. you do that? And realizing that, well, actually, the state that I'm in and the state that I want to be in are two entirely different things. And now how do I get from one to the other? Right. There's an, all, all sorts of different tools and tricks that I've picked up over the years. But certainly body language is one of those whereby, you know, motion drives emotion. So if you if you move in a particular way, if you I mean the science is all there. Amy Cuddy did a fantastic TED talk on this. Awesome. You know your how your how they how they proved. I mean the the grandfather of psychology, a guy called William James, back in the eighteen nineties, proffered this idea about body language and you know act and act as if and and people will start treating you in a particular way if you act that. But, you know, a couple of hundred years later, we were able to get the science. We were able to test the levels of testosterone in people's systems, you know, a few minutes after they stand or move and gesture in a certain way versus if they were more slumped or, or behaving in a, a more nervous way. So there's scientific proof that by changing your body, you can actually change your emotional state and your emotions then our big part of uh, there's a there's a lovely loop there what i call the confidence loop if you're feeling nervous act more confident you start to feel more confident then the actual confident behavior will be become more genuine and more easy because you're actually in the state but there's a great body language a great way of kick-starting that of getting it going in the in the right direction the way we stand the way we sit and the way we gesture and just the fact that we know even if i'm feeling a little bit nervous i know that human beings' primary sense is visual. It's what they can see. So if I can walk out onto that stage, if I can walk into that business meeting, if I can walk into that interview looking confident, then instantly people are going to, they're not, they, they don't have a vial for me to spit in to test my testosterone. They, they, they don't have that, you know. I'll be very worried if I ever walk into an interview and say, can you just spit in this, please? <laughs> <First. laughs> that would be very concerning. But what they are judging is what they can see. So if you stride in purposely, if you make eye contact with people, if you give people a good, strong handshake where you are physically in, in the room, or if you're doing it virtually, you know, if, if what they can see looks confident, then they start to go, well, this person, yeah, they, they, they seem to have got it. And what happens, this lovely thing I call the confidence loop, where we do that, we then notice their reaction going, hmm, this this man this woman they 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 seem to be confident within their own skin and that then doubles back to us and we go ha ah, it's working yeah right. so then the, it starts to become much more genuine you get we get those endorphins and the serotonin and the happy hormones kicking in to back up what we're kind of kickstarting with our body language so i love that aspect of it and being a public speaker and being live on television or live on radio 
uh, the, the first time I ever appeared live on, on television, the, the journalist came to me before the show aired and said this thing to me, I'll never forget. She went, you know, there's 120 people in the room. There are 20 people who are guaranteed a question. You are one of them. Whether you get a second question or not depends upon the quality of your answer. Because I'm going to ask you the question. I'm going to have my producer in my ear. And if my producer says to me, move on, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So your first answer has got to be great. But I can't tell you what the question is yet because the debate that you're analyzing hasn't happened yet. But what I so but that's what I can tell you. You're going to get one question. If you want a second question, the answer's got to be good. So it's like, you know, initially it's like, okay. And then it was like, well, how do you reframe that in your own head? And I noticed my body language shrink and I noticed my start myself start to feel nervous. And then I went, well, that's the natural reaction. But now sit up straight, throw your sh shoulders back, smile and go, what a great opportunity to be able to prove what I can do. So that then the, to be able to, because for me, this isn't theory. I live and breathe and test the stuff. And I, I tested it on, as I say, live BBC interview. And I didn't just get one question. I got, I got about four or five. I got about two minutes of screen time. So the, the fact that it, you can test it yourself, and it, it doesn't have to be particularly complicated, like simple things like this, like the double-handed chop. It's a real good assertion, confidence gesture. Use it. Notice how you feel. Notice how other people start responding to you when you do that versus like flail your hands around or have them behind your back or in your pockets. You can, It's very, very quick and easy to apply this stuff. Notice how it makes you feel and how other people respond to it. And I love that piece. His name is Martin Brooks. The the I, it's not a book, but it is. <laughs> it, it's it's called the Body Language Decoder. It's brilliant. You can find it everywhere. You're listening to him here on a new direction. Hey, folks, listen. Uh, two great sponsors. Uh, Got to get them out. You know what? Have, have you ever had an injury? Have you ever had surgery? Right? Are you suffering for every day you aches and pains? We all do, right? So look, if you're if you want to just even improve how you move and feel, right? Go to Epic Physical Therapy. They're my physical therapist. They're awesome. They help everybody from people like you and me to professional athletes. When you're ready for your epic relief, your epic recovery, and your epic results, just start right there with Epic Physical Therapy. That's epicpt.com. That's E-P-I-C-P-T.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors, for more than 35 years, they've been at the top of the real estate game, helping people sell their home and buy their home. And they keep coming back. Even her clients from 35 plus years ago, continue to come back to help them. Why? Because they say she's a legend of customer service. So when you're ready to get your sold sign, when you're ready to find your first home or your next home, start with Linda Craft at Team Realtors. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. That's lindacraft.com, L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. And we're back here on A New Direction, and I'm with my friend uh, Martin Brooks, who is so much fun. Is he great? Oh, my gosh. He's so awesome. I'm just I'm I, I I I'm just blown away. So uh, these cards, uh, these cards come in uh, seven different colors. There's fifty. There's fifty cards in this deck, and each one, each color. Like I'm holding up a purple card right now, and that's uh, the nervousness category. Um, and uh, this one's called self touch. Mm. Uh, in times of high stress, uh, nerves will often cause people to comfort themselves by rubbing their hands together, stroking their face, or bringing one arm across their body in a half hug, um, recognizing this behavior in others and responding empathetically, particularly if you're the source of the stress will improve your relationships. That's pretty cool. Hmm. I, I, I find that to be pretty cool, right? I mean, but we do, I, I sometimes we don't recognize our own self-touch, do we? Yeah, I mean, this, this, again, there's, there's two things. There's the uh, ability to recognize that we may be in an environment where we don't want to give out that nervousness. You know, and the, and the core psychology behind this, you know, is oxytocin. It's right. that, 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 the love hormone. When somebody hugs us, we get that lovely, warm, fuzzy feeling in our heart that we get from physical touch. Now, if we're in high stress situations, you know, like an interview or a pitch or you're meeting, you know, a really important potential client, you're, you're not going to go, oh, this is really important. I'm feeling really stressed. Uh, sorry, can I get somebody to give me a quick hug first before we have that, <laughs> that meeting or hug them? That would be just really weird. Can I give you a hug? It'll make me feel better. So what people do is they look for ways to give themselves that 
oxytocin. So you know they they will they will rub their hands or uh, I I got this feedback years ago where I, I I would stroke my beard. My boss said to me, I always know when you're stressed because that's the time when you'll sit there and you'll stroke your beard. Right. And it's been proven that people who have pets, you know, dogs and cats, and spend time stroking them in later life get lower levels of stress-related illnesses, cancers, blood pressure, heart disease, because there's something very th therapeutic about stroking a, a furry beast that kind of calms us down. So he said, you're, you're stroking your portable pet. You've got yours with you. You just give it a little <laughs> stroke and it, whenever you're stressed. And I had no idea this was my stress tell. I was, oh my goodness, this is so fascinating, of course. But because it, it releases that oxytocin, it gives that feel good factor. So that so it's like if you're in a situation you want to you want to exude confidence in an interview, meeting uh, 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 somebody who you think might be the love of your life, and you want to give exude that that personal confidence. Then these are behaviors you don't want to do because they're going to undermine that particular strategy. But then the flip side, you know, I do a lot of work with coaching senior leaders and business people. And, you know, they, they miss out on these signals that they might think they're giving the motivational speech or they're, they're helping somebody, you know, by putting them under a little bit of pressure. And then they're not noticing that the person is starting to feel under pressure and is start comforting themselves because they're kind of feeling attacked. And the ability to be able to go, well, hang on a second, I would have thought what I'm saying now would act as a motivating factor, but actually the person's body language is telling me I'm actually reducing their levels of confidence and reducing their levels of self-esteem and reducing their ability now to go off and do the thing that I want them to do because they're, they're self-comforting. They're, they're trying to make themselves feel better, which means I must be making them feel bad. Damn, that's, that wasn't what I wanted. So the ability to be able to self-correct because of, we're looking to be able to tell, hang on a second, I wanted this person to feel more motivated or more, more energized or a more go-getter. And actually, I've said some things, and now the responses are that they're feeling something completely different. Well, right. boy, that was the wrong strategy, or it's not working with this particular person. So that ability to be able to, to read some signals and self-correct and change tack based upon how people are responding to what we said is a huge skill that I think is really, really undervalued as well, but in, in both our, our personal and our professional lives. Uh, yeah, we're we're going to uh, hopefully we're going to get into it. We're, this is because this is so fascinating. I'm enjoying every bit of this. This is awesome. Um, all right, uh, I want to talk about the top tips for body language decoding because you wrote about this too uh, in the book. Um, you said the eyes have it. What do you mean the eyes have it as a tip? Yeah, well, the thing is, with, with with eyes, there's there's so much our our eyes can can tell us about what a person is thinking or feeling. And I mentioned in the uh, one of the earlier things we were discussing there, but when you walk into a room, you know, make eye contact with people. You know that that is a signal of confidence. It's like, you, uh, look me in the eyes. You will see no fear, and I have no hesitation about making my eyes available to you. You know, the old idea, the eyes, the gateway to the soul, uh, which links back to deception as well. Because when people are, it's a deceptive tells when people will, will do what we call prolonged blink. They'll, they'll kind of blink a little bit longer. They'll just, because they basically they don't, they don't want you to see what they're thinking or feeling. They don't want you to see into their soul or, or they'll do blocking. They'll kind of like, all of a sudden, yeah, well, my, the, my, my eyebrows just need straightening there a lot, you know, or my, my glasses just need a lot of adjusting, just trying to block the eyes. Right. So doing the opposite of that, you know, and making good levels of eye contact with people shows confidence. But also, you, you said to me at the start of the, the shot, you know, if I, if I look away and I make notes, you know, that, that, or, or I, I might be replying to somebody. Now, that's interesting because part of your brain was, I don't want Martin to think I'm not paying attention because I'm breaking eye contact. Right. So you're almost like flagging. That's because you know how important eye contact is, yeah. particularly when we're listening. You know, if you give people that eye contact or the virtual world now that we're doing, you know, the temptation is to go off to the side and kind of do things. But, you know, that little camera, that's really important that people see you making eye contact and paying attention. So the eyes are something that, you know, they may not be the big grand things that you're, you're paying attention to. 
but pay attention to people's eyes. They will tell you a lot about what's going on. And of course, with your own eyes, what are you doing? Make sure you're looking and observing and paying attention to what signals people may be giving you and what that might be telling you and how you might adjust to your next question or the next thing that you say. Uh, beautifully. That's just so beautifully done. Um, don't forget the feet is the next tip. Okay, what do you mean, Martin? Don't forget the feet. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Joe Navarro says this thing he said about, you know, that our, our because our feet are so far away from our brain that they, they tend to be unfiltered <laughs> ideas about what's going on. My favorite one is the feet placement. So if you're standing talking to somebody and their feet are pointing directly at you, they're interested. Uh, there's a good general indication that they're interested in what you want, uh, what, the, what, what you're saying. They've got a good level of interest. They're looking at you and their feet are pointing towards you. Now, in the business world, I've been to hundreds and hundreds of networking meetings and had the opportunity to watch this particular piece play out. There's always that thing when you meet somebody at a networking meeting and you're chatting away to them and you're going, inside your head you go, are we done yet? Have, have we both said what we want to say? Can, can I leave? Or, am I, or, or are you still really engaged in what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, and then very often when people are being polite, they'll end up spending maybe 30% of the time they spoke together where they didn't actually need to continue speaking because what they both said what they want to say it was fine, but they weren't sure about when to leave. Yeah, so the feet. So when the feet are pointing towards you, then they're interested. But in that conversation, if one of the feet turns away, then that could be the, their feet telling what the brain is saying. Yeah, I'm kind of ready to go. I've kind of, you know, I'm done here. Can you kind of let me know? Can I, can I go now? It's almost like let me go. Right. Now, the interesting thing about this is that there's, there's a, a number of stages to this. So the first one is the foot, foot turning out. Now, in this stage, normally people are having most of their weight on the foot that's still pointing towards you. Now, you right. want to spot it when at that first stage because stage two is where they transfer their weight onto the foot that's pointing away, which is like, would you please let me leave? Because <laughs> if you don't let me leave, I'm going to go anyway. <laughs> uh, that's beautiful. And the number of times I've been at networking meetings and I see people leaning on that outward turn foot and the other person completely oblivious going, blah, 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 blah. Oh, let me tell you about this thing, blah, blah, blah. And they just don't see the signals because they're not looking down. They're not paying attention to the feet. And it's just absolutely fascinating what the feet can tell you as well. I love that. I, okay, here's one of my favorite. Here's another tip that you gave that I think is one of my favorites. Find the line. What, what is their normal? Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, this is this is one of the, the, the great things about, uh, about deception detection. And it's like even Ek Paul Ekman will say himself, Here's all the, the, the deception detection tools. Here's all the techniques and everything else. But he, his last line in, in the keynote I saw him give was like, however, your, your greatest indication of deception will be what he calls variance from baseline. Variance from baseline. So what's that person's normal baseline? How do they behave? How do they gesture? What's the normal pitch of their voice? What's the normal speed of their voice? What's their normal blink rate? How, how, how often do they look away? That gives you a baseline, you know, of, of, of how they normally communicate. Then you come to some touchy subjects. So if you're, if, I don't know, if you're, if you're talking to a realtor, you know, well, how, how much flexibility has the seller got on price? And they start blinking more and they start breaking eye contact more. And if their speed of speech goes up or if their, their pitch is down here and then they go up here, it's like, oh, that's interesting. Well, <laughs> what just happened there? Right, so if you right. think of like, you know, like a cardio meter, you know, all of a sudden it go, or, you know, the Richter scale, all of a sudden it goes, whoop. <laughs> you know? Ah, now that's interesting. I just peaked there. So that's a, that's a big variance from, from baseline. So when you're first meeting people, particularly if you've got to make a decision, like you're, you're interviewing or being interviewed or it's a salesperson, you know, in 20 minutes, you got to make a decision about where they're going to buy from them or not. If you're interviewing somebody, am I going to hire this person or not? Are we at least going to put them through to the next round. 
then it's a fantastic piece of advice of get the, a good sense of their baseline. So ask them some things that they'd be under no performance anxiety about. How was your weekend? You know, what, what, did, what, did, what did you get up to? So a, particularly, uh, I've done a lot of work in teaching uh, uh, executives in sales and sales roles. And I said that when they come to meet you at the front desk, that the walk from the front desk to the room where the meeting is can be the most valuable piece of body reading real estate that you can get because that's the opportunity to get a good baseline. So how long have you been in this building? Or what's the commute like? Or, you know, how, oh, how, have they got it? Where, where are the best restaurants around here where you go to at lunchtime? Any piece of communication that will be give you that normal piece of baseline between meeting you at the front desk and then at the meeting room or the, the, the conference room, wherever you're having that meeting, that's hugely useful. That, that chit chat that you will have on the way to the meeting, or even, even if you are sat down at the start of a meeting or in a, or in a Zoom call or whatever it is. Oh, hey, how's it going? What's the time over there? Where are you? Oh, fantastic. What's the weather like? All of that is an opportunity to get a, a baseline for body language, for voice, for pitch, all of those things which then gives you the contrast of when you talk about price or availability or whether something that you think somebody might be deceptive later. It gives you a contrast between, well, here's the baseline, here's what's happening now. Ah, that's interesting. That, that tells me a lot. And that can help you decide, well, what question am I going to ask next or what ultimately is going to be my decision? Gather as much information in you, as you can. And variance from baseline is a, is a fantastic phrase that I've stolen from Paul Ekman about figuring out you know, the truthfulness of the person right now versus when they were talking to me about something fairly innocuous like what they did at the weekend. His name is Martin Brooks. The book, uh, the cards, the book, the booklet, the booklet, and the cards. It's I don't know. I guess that's what we call, it's called Body Language Decoder. It's brilliant. You're listening to him here on a new direction. Hey, folks, they talk about my two sponsors, um, Epic Physical Therapy. Listen, they offer the most advanced top of the line equipment: Ultra G Anti Gravity Treadmill, the Normatec Compression Sleeves, Game Ready. That's just a few. And they are trained and certified in the most comprehensive cutting edge treatments available, blood flow restriction therapy, dry needling, cupping, and that's just a few. Listen, when you're ready for your epic relief, your epic recovery, and your epic results, do not go any further. Go to Epic Physical Therapy. That's epicpt.com. That's E-P-I-C-P-T dot com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors for over 35 years. They have helped people with their real estate wants and needs. They have helped people sell their home. They have helped people buy their home. They've helped people buy their first home. They've helped people buy their next home. And they all keep coming back. Thousands of people have done it over the years, used Linda Craft and Team Realtors for their real estate needs. You should be one too. Just go to lindacraft.com. That's L I N D A C R A F T dot. Com. Martin, we're going to take a quick break right here and um, just for, for about two minutes and we're going to come right back. Are you okay with that? Cool. Okay, hold on. I apologize for that. We had um, we had a little technical difficulty that I am the only one in the studio that had to take care of, and so I apologize um, to everybody who's watching and listening. 
um, we'll edit that out, but we got it all under control now. So I, so I apologize again to everyone out there. All right, here we go. We'll pick it up here. And we're back here on A New Direction with Martin Brooks and his book, Body Language Decoder. Um, Martin, let's talk about some applications here. And let's talk about specifically business applications. I want to talk about uh, when we are in uh, the situation when we're interviewing people. Uh, what, what should we be looking for in terms of like, how do I know if this person really wants this job? Hmm. Yeah. So one of the sections that we we have is uh, in the in the card decks. You said they're all they're all color coded. Is a conviction. Mm. You know the level. Anybody can say something, but how can I measure the 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 depth of their commitment or the, the, the their, their conviction to that? Some signs that we can look for that. And one of those, which is particularly interesting, I find is animation. When people are just just gesticulating with their hands more, now when people tend to be genuinely emotional about something, that's when they will move their hands, they'll, 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 and, and their face to become more expressive in their face. So if you say to ask somebody a question that if they genuinely wanted the job, then they go, "What are you most excited about about the about, about the job? What, what what parts of it do you think you know are really going to float your boat? Are really going to play to your strengths?" And that's what was really interesting then, uh, designing questions to see if you get the signals that you, sh that you should be getting or you'd like to get or be normal to get. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I always challenge interviewers to do. Think about the questions that will facilitate the particular things that you're looking for. So ask questions like that. So if somebody is genuinely excited and genuinely enthused, and genuinely feel that their their skill set is a, is, a, is a fit. Well, ask them a question around that, and let's see: Do we get the animation? Do we get people's hands moving at that particular point in time? Because if their their gestures are fairly muted and their voice is muted, you don't get that emotion uh, emotional range in their voice. Then that's kind of interesting. Maybe this is just a, 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 a they're looking to fill for six months in this job before they go off and do something else. And then coming back to your great question earlier about baseline. And if you said, well, maybe they're just not somebody who's that animated, but if you've asked them on the way to the interview about, you know, what, what's, what do you like doing in your spare time? They go fishing. Oh, when was the last time you got fishing? Or what, 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 what was the biggest fish you ever caught? And they're, and they're like, oh my goodness, let me tell you about this time I caught this fish and it was huge. And I go, well, okay. So when they're talking about being really excited about fishing, they do gesticulate. They do use their hands. Their face is animated. Their voice does change pitch and tone and pace. But when I ask them a similar question about what they're really looking forward to about working here, I didn't get any of that. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Okay. It's not definitive, but it's 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 interesting. It's a flag. It's something you'd certainly want to explore a, a little more. So it's almost like thinking about what what behaviors should I see or what I like to see, and then craft questions to create the opportunity for those things to shine through. And if they don't, Hmm, maybe that's interesting about what that, the, that person's level of conviction. And of course, if you're interviewing, you're not just going to be interviewing one person, you're going to be interviewing a number of people. Right. And if other people then exhibit those behaviors at that point to a similar question, well, maybe they are a better choice. Mm. See, this is, this is the piece, though, I think that's so imperative that you bring out. And that is, okay, getting a baseline, it, it, critical, but then it's it's probing deeper. Mm. We 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 sometimes will stop and go. I see what I want to see, and we move on. But it may not be accurate. Yeah. Right. Which see, and I think there's also another piece in this uh, that you talk about at length here, and that is um, in the color purple, the nervousness. Right. Because we, you know sometimes candidates can be nervous about interviewing. And yeah. so we have to pay attention to those signals as much as we pay attention to, okay, well, maybe they don't really want the job. Well, nervousness can give us tells that aren't accurate either, right? I mean, is that part of it too? Or shouldn't that be clued into that as well? Absolutely. So in an interview, for me, it's always about is it the environment or is it content? 
So if somebody can be a brilliant public speaker and really know their, somebody, sorry, sorry, let me backtrack. Somebody can be a real subject expert, really know their stuff. And mm -hmm. if you talk to them one-to-one, -one, you know, they come across really confidently. Now I've coached very senior executives in business schools, as you kindly said in your, in your introduction there. And I've sat down and talked to CEOs and VPs and just been struck by the incredible experiences that they've had and places they've done and business deals and businesses they've built. And then I was there specifically to coach them on how to be a better public speaker. So they stand up in front of a room in front of four or five of their peers, plus an expert who's going to be analyzing their every move. And it's, it used to strike me constantly the sea change in terms of their behavior, knowing that they're being analyzed by their peers and by somebody else, and they're all of a sudden getting all these nervous behaviors. And like part of my brain would go, well, where was that confident woman that I was talking to five minutes ago who right. ran this multi-million dollar international business versus this woman up here now who's giving me you know, loads of nervous behaviors? And that's got nothing to do with their capability but get everything to do with the environment. They're stepping into an environment they find stressful. And that's where we got a, you know, like culture context, you know, situations that people are in that you touched on earlier. You know, we could, we could rush to quick judgments in a particular environment, like a job interview, like a big presentation or, or pitch, or like in a meeting, just all of a sudden be put on the spot. Is it the environment or the scenario or the context that's driving those nervous behaviors versus what the person actually knows or thinks? Mm. And we always have to have that kind of critical, you know, thinking cap on. Is this, is this environment or is this really indicative of what the person is thinking or feeling about the content? To, to be able to separate those out. And that's where one of the tips I have in the, in the little booklet is, you know, if you want to, really get the best out of somebody in an interview and you notice these nervous behaviors, put them at ease. Say, you know, I, I, I always used to find interviewing being, being interviewed really stressful and you, you never imagine, I, I, you know, I forgot my boss's name when I was interviewed once, or I forgot the name of our key product, you know, build that empathy, build that relationship, put people at ease because we want the best. We want to get the best quality data from them to make a decision on. So that's where I think it's really important to, uh, in those scenarios, if you can put people at ease and take away some of that environmental stress, right. then you can get a better picture of who they are as opposed to rushing in going, yeah, look at all these nervous behaviors or maybe deceptive behaviors. Clearly they're not the person for the job or they're not the company for us to work with or they're not the person for me to date. Well, hang on a second is this just a bit of performance anxiety as opposed to skill? You know, those are two very different right. things. And if you can put somebody at ease better by noticing some of those nervous signals, then you're going to get a much better read of what's really going on and how they're really thinking or really feeling or what they can really contribute to this job or this business venture or to your life as a potential life partner. Uh, that, that's so awesome. Okay. I want to, now I want to go to the sales. Right, because I think there, there, there is so much when it comes to selling people something, right? I mean, you have the thing called the power play and people expressing interest. And I know that those two play a role. Confidence plays a role. Mm -hmm. But connection is so important. Um, I think we talk, you know, I think, I know. We talk often in, in, in sales, right? They talk about uh, building rapport. Yeah. Right, so frequently. But, but it connecting with that potential customer, because by the way, folks, if you're out there B2B or B2C, at the end of the day, you're talking to people, okay? Yeah. I mean, that, that's the honest truth. You're, you're going to make a connection with people. So don't, don't get caught up. Well, it's not the same in B2B, B2C. No, somebody's making a decision and that's a person. It's not an entity. So yeah. connection becomes important. So it's all P2P. That's what I say. Anyway, yeah. so let's talk about the sales process. Where, what we should be paying attention to if I'm if I'm the salesperson right um, what should I be what should I be looking for maybe in terms of connection or maybe am I playing too much of a power play what what what's what should I be cautioning myself with or looking for 
you know, what's, what's interesting to talk about sales, I mean, I, I, my background was in sales. I, I started my, my first job as a salesperson back in 1991, 15th of August, 1991. The, uh, the I remember that. I specifically <laughs> remember that date. 15th of August, 1991 was my, uh, I don't know the jobs before, but that was where my career started in sales. And I ended up doing a lot of sales leading and sales coaching. And then when I set up my own, consultancy business in 2002 uh, sales training and for me it's you know you you're so right it's not b2b it's not b2c it's all p2p you know uh, the, i think it was the rapper chuck uh, chuck d said uh, in order to, for people to buy from you they have to buy into you mm. in order for people to buy from you they have to buy into you right. now so then we're talking about rapport we're talking about relationship we're talking about trust we're talking about empathy now, all of those things we want to be aiming for, but how do we do that? How do we notice what is or isn't happening? And how do we, I mean, one of the, the biggest underrated body language things is how can you communicate that you're listening? You know, we talked about the importance of the of the eyes. So even, even the mouth cover, just to rest your chin on your hand and put one finger over your lips, which is a clear visual signal to the other person. You've got the talking stick. I'm listening. You know, because what do salespeople love doing? You know, I know I'm one of them. They love talking. But actually to ask a really clever question, so what are the biggest challenges in your business? What 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 worries you? Tell me. And just and just shut up. <laughs> and and clearly signal to the person, you know, but but with the mouth cover, you are now talking. Now we're not just doing that because it's a good thing to do to let people talk but genuinely listen. And that's where you want to use your facial expression. We talk about mirroring expressions. So if somebody says, that's really frustrating. You'd want to go, and, and they're going, it's so frustrating that you know, they screw up their face. And it's, it's very annoying. And you want to go, mm, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I get it. So you're signaling with your body language back, empathy. I've been there too. I felt that. Yes, that was so irritating. And that builds connection. It's when human beings are experiencing the same emotion at the same time. That is a huge psychological uh, connection when there is that, that, that meeting of emotions. We're both experiencing the same emotion. That's why you can be standing at, at a carousel in an airport and not talking to the person left or right of you. But announcement comes on, oh, we're really sorry, the baggage is going to be delayed. We don't have enough body language. Now, we don't have enough uh, body um, uh, luggage people you know, to get the stuff off. Everybody around that carousel feels the same emotion at the same time. Mm -hmm. So nobody was talking to each other. 30 seconds after that announcement, it was, oh, this, this is so annoying, isn't it? Yes, it happened to me. Didn't it happen to you? And you look around that carousel. And next time you're in an airport, and, and I think like that happens, look at what nobody's talking to each other because everybody's looking at that little black rectangle, blue bag, blue bag. Come on, come on, come on. It's the blue bag. You know that blue bag wants to come out. <laughs> and everybody's doing the same thing, and nobody's talking to each other. That announcement comes out. We all experience the same emotion at the same time. 30 seconds later, everybody's talking and moaning and complaining. We That permission to talk to each other, the desire to talk to each other, is predicated on all experiencing the same emotion at exactly the same time. It's hugely powerful. So to be able to visually indicate empathy or feeling the same emotion. Now, it could be a positive emotion. You know, it could be, oh, yeah, we changed this thing and it worked really well. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, so it, it's, it's, it's the mirroring of emotion that your body language is showing i get that emotion you're feeling because i'm feeling it too but let me show you through my body language and that creates that connection that creates that empathy that creates that that trust to build on in order to build a relationship that you would need to be able to work together in a selling buying scenario do you know we've been on an hour <laughs> is it already <laughs> yeah, we've been on an hour i know i've had a blast i could keep going i've had a blast but we've been on an hour uh already at the show you've been great i i just wanted to tell you you've been great this is the 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 language body language decoder is fantastic how can people get a hold of you okay so the, the website success through impact.com has got lots of videos and tips and on there if people are on linkedin Look me up, Martin Brooks, B-R-O-O-K-S. You can find me on there. Again, I've released some 
uh, cool little tips and bits and pieces and observations that I've seen in the news and body language decoder. You can find it on Amazon. His name is Martin Brooks. The, the cards, the 50 cards, body language decoder. I told you he was brilliant and he was better than that. I'm going to be, listen, folks, you know, I say to you every week, you're in control of two things, regardless of your circumstances, that is your attitude and your effort. Doesn't matter what they are. You can always control those two things. May not be always easy, but you can take control of them now. I'm going to be back next week with another great guest. It's going to be another great book. It's going to be another great show. As I say to you all over, all over the world, you know what that is. Ciao, everybody.